President Tricia, fellow Rotarians and guests, it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Ryan as our speaker today. I met Tom in 2014 when he spoke at two prayer meetings about his story. Tom is the head coach of the Ohio State University men's wrestling team. Tom, his wife Lynette, and their four children moved to Columbus in 2000, spring of 2006, 10 years ago. Tom wrestled at Iowa, graduated in 1993 with a BS in education. Prior to his current Ohio State University position, he coached at Hofstra from 1995 to 2006. At Hofstra, his teams had great success with six consecutive conference titles. His Ohio State University team successes have brought wrestling to national prominence, including their first ever men's wrestling national championship in 2015. His OSU win-loss record is almost 73%. He is three-time National Coach of the Year. He maintains a high standard for his, of excellence for his student athletes, and they are involved in various community service initiatives. He believes service is crucial to building life champions. Think of Rotary Service Above Self. All of you have ever, <laughs> I'm sorry, all of you have either been in an interview as a candidate and or as an interviewer in your careers, correct? And some of you have wrestled in this endeavor, but not likely literally as Tom has. I hope you'll share that story about recruiting, aka an interview with Logan. Tom will share his life about his family, faith, wrestling, including, including the Olympics in Rio this summer. His video clip is one you will share with friends, family, and coworkers today. Please give a warm Columbus Rotary welcome for Coach Tom Ryan. Well, it's great to be here with you all today. Uh, I, I did, um, I'm appreciative Callaway asked me to speak. As he mentioned, a few years back we met when Harvey had me speak at uh, one of the gathering events. And um, so, again, good to be here. You know, I went onto your website, the Rotary website, and I noticed that uh, this Rotary began, and of course I saw the mission, uh, which, which is um, service over self. Uh, that is, a, that is um, something that, that as, a, as a coach of college student athletes, we talk a lot about, but it takes some time to really understand that. I think it's, I think it's as, we, as we move into the later phases of life, uh, we have children, that it's a lot easier to really understand what that all, stands, what that all means. But um, s service above self, I saw. I also saw this rotary started in 1912. So 1912, we're talking about 104 years. That's a lot of lives impacted. Uh, by people coming together and making a difference. So um, it's great to be with you guys today. Uh, someone I read a lot about, I like to study people much smarter than me. There's a lot of them. Um, C.S. Lewis is one that I like to read a lot of his, his stuff. And he said, the next, the next best thing to being wise oneself is to live in a circle of those who are. And I think that's something that, uh, that is critically important in our lives. Uh, it has been for me as I moved from the University of Iowa to Hofstra and now Ohio State, just being around people that really build you up and see things uh, sometimes in a way even better than you. And the other one I like that from C.S. Lewis is what draws people to be friends is that they see the same truth. They share it. And all those that have walked this path with me uh, as I move through life, it's been people that really see things in a very similar way that I do. So I'm really blessed and thankful for that. So as Callaway said, my name's Tom Ryan. I've been in Columbus for 10 years, and what a blessing it's been. Um, I would say uh, emphatically that if someone said, listen, you have two options. You get to choose one. One is, um, we're going to guarantee you that you win lotto, right? $10 million jackpot. Or you can be the head wrestling coach at Ohio State. The decision would be extremely easy for me. <laughs> I'd be the head wrestling coach at Ohio State. So I'm just really fortunate. I mean, I feel very blessed. Uh, a Callaway point, I, I have four kids. So I'll, I'll go into um, just uh, kind of what I would call um, from light to dark to light, right? And it, it has to do with a cha the changed mind. I'll show you the video that uh, in just a second here about this summarizes our season. We just finished with the National Wrestling Championships. They were in Madison Square Garden. Over 120,000 people came over three days. Every day was a sellout. There are 10 weight classes in college wrestling. We were fortunate to have two NCAA champions. So I'll just share some facts. And the facts are irrelevant to some point. 
So, so some things that have happened in the last few years, and I see Kevin sitting here, Kevin Walsh, and I know a lot of others that have helped Blake Kaplan this year as the president of our Olympic program, but Kevin was one of the first people on board when I got here. He also he understands the sport. He, 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 um, we had one endowed scholarship when we got here. We now have 10. Uh, Kevin was one of those, so I'm thankful for Kevin for many, many, for many reasons other than that. So, so first, um, we've had more national champions in the last eight years than our first 90 as a program. We've had the fourth four-time NCAA champion in NCAA wrestling history. Only four men on earth have won four national titles. We had one last year, Logan Stever. This past summer, we had the youngest world champion in U.S. history, 19 years old. Uh, Kyle beat the three-time reigning world champion from Russia in the finals as a 19-year-old. We've had more freshmen win the national championship in the last five years than nearly every NCAA team combined. We've had more team, world team members than any other team in the country over the last eight years. We're in the process of fundraising and nearly done with, uh, we're gonna build a new $10 million freestanding wrestling complex that will allow the amazing men that we have in the program to train in a facility that uh, is similar to the type of men they are. Um, as uh, Mr. Mr. Robertson pointed out, we, we won our first national championship this past year. And so you get an idea of the landscape. Wrestling started Division I in 1921. Since 1921, only 12 schools in the history of the sport have won. It's been monopolized by a few. So we were the 12th school. So I want to show you a, a quick video. It's like a minute and 50 seconds. And I'll just share a little bit about what, what really the, the genesis of the talk is all about. And that's about the power of a changed mind. The power of a changed there mind. There is nothing as powerful as a changed mind. You can change your hair, your clothing, your address, your spouse, your residence. But if you don't change your mind, the same experience will perpetuate itself over and over again because everything outwardly changed, but nothing inwardly changed. If you want something out of life, if you want to change yourself, if you want to acquire something, if there's some goal that you want to reach, changing your behaviors, overcoming negative habits, it's challenging. It's hard. Most people go through life never discovering what their talents are. Most people never develop their talents. The only thing that's going to make you happy, my friend, and this year or any other, is to step up. It's to raise the standard. It's to discover what you're capable of and feel that incredible power of pushing through whatever's holding you back and get to the other side of more of your true self. That's what this game's all about. When you step into your fears and continue to push yourself to go on, something happens for you. If you look at somebody who's really successful and you think, wow, I mean, they're, they're so amazing, they're such a genius, you gotta dig underneath and you gotta remember something. People are rewarded in public for what they've practiced for years in private. So that was a recap, a short recap of the finals of the national championships and talking about a changed mind. And I'll share with you just uh, how critical that is and, and, and when for me did, did that occur. So the why, you know, the why, of why, the why of it is so critical. So for me as a young person, I grew up on, in Long Island, New York, uh, an amazing family, an amazing mother, I would say that my mother was the closest thing to God that I've met on earth. Uh, she raised seven children. Um, we didn't have much, but we had everything. Uh, I had a fishing pole. Uh, I had a pair of wrestling shoes. I had a headgear. Uh, I had some great friends. I had love in the house. Um, the things that we all search and dig so deeply for, for me as a young person, were available. I wanted for nothing. I got involved in wrestling because I wasn't very good at basketball. I mean, that's just the reality of it. I thought I was going to be an NBA player. Uh, my seventh grade coach brought some truth to my life 
and he said, you're not very good. Uh, you foul way too much. You should try wrestling. So wrestling was a huge deterrent for me because of the singlet. If you've seen wrestling, what we had to wear as a seventh grader, it was a concern for me. I wasn't going to wear it. But I first day in the room, I fell in love with it. And I didn't need, I didn't know I needed a changed mind, but I did. I lived an amazing life with very little suffering, only the suffering that I chose to undergo was part of my life. So we all know I at recruits parents ask, is my kid have what it takes to make it at the next level? The answer to that question is pretty simple. I'll ask them a question. How much are they willing to suffer? Sacrifice, many years back, the ancient Greeks did not use the term love. They used the term, how much are you willing to sacrifice? That amount of sacrifice would determine your love for something. So for many years, as a high school wrestler and a college wrestler, I only understood what I would consider as chosen suffering. I chose to put somebody on my back and carry them up a hill. I chose to do the extra sprints. I chose all these things made sense to me. Chosen suffering made a lot of sense. The greater the suffering, the perhaps the greater the reward. I'm moving through life and things are going really well. I'm the head coach at Hofstra University. Uh, my team is in position uh, to be one of the elite teams in the country and Ohio State calls. They're looking for a coach. I interview at Ohio State University, and just prior to that, I had what I would consider a vision correction. I went from living in a world I thought was really light to incredible darkness. So I don't know any of you that well personally. I do know a few of you. But I can tell you I moved from a place of light to darkness. It was February 16, 2004 for me. Again, I don't know what any of you have experienced. But all that I knew about was chosen suffering made sense. I was about to embark on a journey that I had no clue was possible. On February 16, 2004, it was President's Day. All my children were with me at work, all four of them. We came home that night. There was a family dinner on the table my wife had cooked. I had a meeting that night. I canceled it. Everything I tell you is true. Nothing's embellished. It's the way it was for me. Dinner's on the table. I had a meeting that night with my booster club. I, I said, I'm not going to make it. I was at dinner with a family. We had an amazing family dinner. We laughed. Four kids, my wife and I, we reflected on the day. The number of things that I now look back at that I took for granted. At about 6.30 at night, my son Teague, who was five, healthy, was with me all day, loved wrestling, could do 10 pull-ups, was chosen to take a shower first. So he gets up from the table, he starts running around. I'm watching it happen. We're laughing. Get him, Lynn. My wife's name is Lynn. Catch him. They're playing hide and go seek, one of the great games of all time. She finally catches him. She's hiding behind a wall. She scoops him up. And something hit me at that time. I don't, again, not to tell you a fish story, the bottom line is I remember feeling overwhelmed by something when I watched. So she picked him up, she carried him to the back of the house. We were carrying on our conversation at the dinner table, and she began screaming that he wasn't breathing. So I ran to the back of our house, I grabbed Teague, I put him on the coffee table, and I began to try to resuscitate him. He had no pulse, and he wasn't breathing. My wife called 911, and we were frantic. And I tell you this story only because the power of a changed mind, how hard is it for someone to convince you to think another way? For me, so many had shared with me. But I wasn't ready for my mind to change. So the only way that so often we change is that we are hit with something so overwhelming. The picture that I want you to take of me after this scenario, I'll share with you where I was. So when she calls 911, they come rushing to the house. It took 14 minutes. At one point, I picked him up and ran about 100 yards to the end of the street. Hoping the, I knew we needed professional help. They didn't come. I ran back, put them back on the coffee table. My kids are asking me what's wrong, pleading with me. Why wouldn't he wake up? They were 11, 9, 5, and 3 at the time. 
I now have a senior, Jordan, that's going to graduate from Ohio State University in May. I've got a freshman, Jake, who was nine at the time, a redshirt freshman, who is now a starting wrestler for us at Ohio State University. My life is incredibly blessed. But I had to go through a dark time. So the ambulance arrives. They run in the house. And I remember, I remember seeing them pull up through the big bay window we had in our house. The, amb the lights pulled up, and they were walking to my driveway. We were frantic inside. How many times did they take for granted a 911 call? We needed them sooner. They walked in the house, and I just remember all of my anger that it took so long spewed out on them. Where were you? Where were you? It's been 14 minutes. And they grabbed T. And they picked him up, and then they were running. They ran him into the ambulance. My wife and I jumped in the ambulance. We followed them from behind, like a movie. We can see through the little windows of the ambulance they're working on them. And two things occurred. The first thing is I called my brother, my best friend, an example for me in his life. He was two years older than me. I called him and said, something happened to Teague. Here's the hospital we're going to. Please let the family know. And the second thing that occurred, that my wife and I had been married for 12 years. We were holding hands, we were crying, and we were praying. We were praying together. We needed a miracle. We took so many things for granted. So many choices we'd made throughout our life. There's one choice that I'll get to that supersedes all others. But my mind wasn't ready to comprehend that. So we get to the hospital, the family starts to gather, about 90 minutes go by and the surgeon comes out and he tells us that he's sorry. That they couldn't save Teague. Here's what's crazy, I was 36 years old. I've been alive for 36 years, coaching, I've been coaching for 13 years, leading people. I was gonna learn a lot about myself and about my view and why, what caused my mind to change in the why I'm here. So I'm in the backyard as families gathering at the funeral. We're in the backyard and people are gathering in the house. My uncle comes to the back of the house and he said, you know the meaning of life? And I thought, you know, wrestling was my God. I didn't need a lesson. I was, I was always around my kids, my wife. We had a great family life, far from perfect, but I understood what was important. And he said, the goal is to impact as many lives as you can and get to heaven. What? Get to heaven. That was something I didn't think much about. Well, I can tell you that this darkness that I was in, I went from a coach that was high energy to a guy that would curl up under his covers at night and just cry. Our family, a year later, would move from New York to Ohio living our lives here, making friends. They were going to schools, making different friends. I was meeting a new department, new alumni, making lots of friends. And all along this time, there was this heaviness in our heart. I see the only ex analogy that maybe I could use would be you're, in a, you're on a cruise ship with your family in the middle of the night, in the middle of the Atlantic, and you're thrown off. And the ship's not turning around. It's heading away. And you've got two options. You can die, or you can change the way you're thinking and do something about it. Well, I can tell you all that I had a change of mind. Here's what it boiled down to for me. Many had shared with me before, pretty simple. There's two options. They both can't be true. I took my mind, and I kept it where it was, and I considered two options. If, I'm sorry, I'm, what was your name? I know we met briefly. Dick, if Dick and I, cleared away all these tables and you all kind of stood around the edge, the edge and we wrestled for an hour and Dick went home and said coach Ryan is not a very good wrestler he may be able to coach but I beat him a hundred and nothing and I went home and told my wife I wrestled this really really nice guy Dick uh, and I beat him a hundred and nothing what's happening Someone's lying, right? It's one or the other. It can't be both. In this case, and nothing against Dick, it probably would have been Dick. <laughs> but someone 
It's one or the other. So in this darkness that I'm in, I explore two options. That I'm here by accident. That I'm the end result of some random occurrence. That my life is nothing but a chance. Or option two, they are both not sure that there's a loving God that cares about me and wants the best for me. Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor turned psychiatrist, said this, to live is to suffer, but to survive is to find meaning in that suffering. And what is that meaning? The why for me changed everything. The reason why I believe that we're having the type of success that we're having is because we understand the why at Ohio State Wrestling. We understand why we're here and where we're going. And it's not easy. It's challenging. The world's full of temptations. But the why became clear. I moved from light to dark to light. And my life, if someone would have told me at the time I lost my five-year-old son that I'd ever laugh again or enjoy any bit of happiness, I would say that was not the case. So I'm here to today to tell you that uh, there is tremendous greatness in love and the fact that we are all created in the image of something far better and greater than anyone. So God bless you guys and go Bucks. <laughs> Questions about Ohio State Wrestling? Yes. This is sort of a specific to your observation in general. The argument about nature versus nurture and whether people are born with an inner, whatever it is, resilience, toughness, or whether it's trained into them. You have most of the people you deal with that have not been through this dark kind of time. What's your reflection on how you bring them to see that they need to change their mind and what that change has to be? Yeah, so that's a great question. I hope you heard what he was, he was asking, but uh, that's a kind of a deep question and a great question. But I would say this, my focus for them is on several things, but the main one is that they understand what suffering feels like. And I'm really good at that. <laughs> so so I, one of the objectives of a coach, right, I have two coaches. So I have two coaches. I meet with two people that challenge me. Because I think one of the things that happens with all of us as leaders is that we're always challenging others. Right? So I'm constantly assessing everybody else. And what can happen in the process of, assess of assessing everybody else, you stop assessing yourself. So I have two people that remind me weekly, uh, and anyone has a wife, she'd be the third, uh, <laughs> that I'm no good, I need to work on me. Right? So, so I have two life coaches, I would call them. One is Chet Scott uh, from Built to Lead, and one is Tom Rohde uh, with Athletes in Action. But uh, so, so one thing that we, we have to do is you look at, you study the greats in anything. I don't believe that God necessarily sprinkled any magic dust on any one of us to say this individual is gonna go on to do this or do that. I'm not saying he can't do that, because he can. Listen, I also believe that he could have saved my son. So he could have but chose not to. That's a big step for me to make. But one thing that we focus on in Ohio State Wrestling is creating an environment that is more difficult than any environment that they'll face outside of the Ohio State Wrestling Room. So they're prepared for anything that comes along. We have the best Olympic development program in the United States. What does that mean? To use an example from a basketball standpoint, it would be like taking the NBA All-Stars and having them train side by side with the Ohio State basketball team. Your reflexes, your speed, uh, you'll be humbled often, which will help you grow, uh, is improved. So, so to answer the question, I guess, really directly, s there's a great book called Outliers, and then he went around the world and studied elite people. Why is it that this little community in Brazil can produce some of the best soccer players in the world? Uh, why is it that a small community in a little province in Russia can produce some of the best women's tennis players? The environment. The environment is wildly difficult, and they are around people that challenge them on a daily basis. So the short version of that is, I think that we all as parents, if you had 
raise children that, whether it was math class or an instrument, you wanted to put them around the best people. And there's definite, there's, there's, there's truth to that. For Logan, you told a story a couple years ago about your experience in recruiting Logan. So, so Logan Stieber was the four-time NCAA champion that I was referring to. Only four people on earth had ever done that. And you know, I'm obviously a lot better looking, but not as recognizable as Urban Meyer is. Uh, so Urban uh, is, is recognized anywhere he goes. In fact, teeing this up, I had, uh, I, do you, I'm a big ice cream fan. So, so I love ice cream. So the ice, when I hear the ice cream man come to the neighborhood, I get in my car and I find him. <laughs> so I was wearing an Ohio State wrestling shirt in two stories and, and uh, I pull up to the ice cream man and he said, Ohio State wrestling. Do you know uh, Miles Martin? Miles was the kid that won a national championship as a freshman, the first true freshman to ever do it at Ohio State and the 15th in history. And I said, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. I do know Miles Martin. He's a really good wrestler. The other one was Logan Stieber. I was at the, uh, I was at, um, at the bank uh, making likely withdrawal, and I had an Ohio State wrestling shirt on. And Logan had just won his fourth national title, and I made a comment in the paper. I thought people could comprehend better than he won four national titles. And the comment was, Logan Stieber has won more, uh, th th there's been more people to walk on the moon than to win four Division I NCAA wrestling championships. So fast forward a month later, I'm at the teller, and the teller said, so Ohio State Wrestling, and said, hey, do you hear about this Logan Stieber kid? And I said, yeah, I know this Logan Stieber kid. He's a really good wrestler. So my point in all that is, is uh, I mean, Urban wouldn't have those type of situations. I do. So Logan Stieber, as a 10th grader, we knew he was really special. He had been schooled, to your question, in an, in an area that was a lot of tough guys trained together. And I watched him wrestling, oh my gosh, we gotta have this guy, he's gonna change the program. So anyway, I set up a clinic where he and I can meet. Within NCAA rules, we're gonna go do a clinic, I'm gonna teach at it, I'm gonna make sure he's there, because I wanna befriend him. So we wrestle, he weighed about 112 pounds, sopping wet, 112. He, by the way, Logan pinned everybody in the state tournament all four years. Nobody went to full match with him. So, I, so he's there, I'm there, a lot of people are around, and I start wrestling with Logan. And he hits me with a double leg. Now, I weighed about 180, and I was 40. He weighed like 112, he was like 15. So he picks me up and slams me down. <laughs> Which, by the way, if you're the head coach at Ohio State, you're, it's a little embarrassing, <laughs> right? So I'm sitting against the wall after the live wrestling ended, and he sits next to me. And I didn't let him get the takedown, but I wanted to congratulate him on the nice move. So I said, Logan, uh, that was a great double leg. Now he's a 10th grader, and he looks over at me, and he goes, yeah, but it only works on old people. <laughs> so that's true, that's Logan Stieber, and that's why I think uh, you know, he's a great leader for us and a great example. So uh, we're, I'm really fortunate, really blessed uh, to, be, uh, to be leading this program. Uh, we have an Olympian, if you'd watch him, he'll wrestle August 21st. He's a sophomore. He's gonna rewrite all the record books uh, in college wrestling and also, uh, I, I believe, on the world level. His name's Kyle Snyder. He's got a 3.8. His brother just graduated from West Point. His father is very much involved in Homeland Security. He has an amazing uh, attitude toward life and what's important. And you can watch him. As I said, he's just a sophomore. Compete August 21 is the last day of the Olympics, and that's when uh, his weight class will compete. He's the reigning world champion and the favorite to win a gold medal uh, in Rio. Any other questions, yeah? I've got one quick one. Uh, how did you, when you first came here, with Ohio State not being very good, recruit or convince a kid to uh, come to Ohio State versus some other good school at, uh, at wrestling? Yeah, so, so, so I, I do want to share that, uh, the, 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 so I think the goal for each of us, the goal for me is to leave Ohio State in a better place than I found it, right? So the coach before me was a legend. So I don't know how you, how many know, you know Russ Hellickson, but the team, this guy was a legend. He was, he was one of the best wrestlers in the history of, of United States wrestling. And the program at the time was really good. Uh, part of the, the, the reason why they were an elite is because to some degree, you only climb as high as the people around you wanna go. And Gene Smith has been the AD now. He, he came just before I got there. 
He was the AD at three of the 12 schools that won the NCAAs. And in the sport of wrestling, we're backed, right? So it's not like, you know, we've got this magic in us. There's been plenty of people here that could run the program. Um, but one of the things that we did is we reached out to the community to build an Olympic development program. No team in history has won the NCAAs without an Olympic development program in their community. Well, in order to build an Olympic training center, you need resources. That was, that's the number one thing. You need funding to pay Olympic athletes. So these guys have graduated from college. Their, their job is to train full time, and it's, it's not inexpensive. Some of them we give $2,000 a month to, some $3,000. But the number one thing we did was to build an Olympic training center, but also hire people that had impeccably high standards, they had high character people on the coaching staff. So you, you, you hire the coaches to develop them, and you put a system in place that uh, a high school wrestler can come here, get a degree, get their masters, and make an Olympic team. Yes, sir. Yeah, they, they just had a panel at Ohio State last Friday morning on uh, whether you pay uh, college athletes or not. I don't know. I don't think you were on. A, I don't. I don't remember seeing you. Yeah. I didn't go to it, but I, you know, looked at it online. I guess what is what is your feeling about about paying college athletes and that you know that seems to be a major issue now. Yeah, no, that's a big issue. I think that um, you know for minors, you know, obviously uh, the sport of wrestling. Uh, there's 10,000 high schools that have wrestling. Over two, 250,000 young people wrestle in this country. It's a sport that makes a difference in the community, right? But the challenge is, as you start to pay people, the main sports, the bigger sports, the sports that get most of the funding, and nothing, listen, I love Urban, I love Jim Trestle, I love football because they pay our bills, <laughs> right? I mean, I love them for other reasons, but, but their income uh, certainly helps lo other, other sports, so the challenge is as you begin to pay uh, the football and basketball players, that money has got to come out of somewhere. And the concern is that as it comes out of somewhere, is it going to be taken from a sport like wrestling and other non-revenue sports? So it's, you know, it's a fine line. I do think they should get something. I also think that if you look at the Ohio State football or basketball budget, you've got a strength coach that takes a young kid to an absolute freak of nature man where they get recruited to play in the pros. You've got nutritionists. You've got trainers, you've got facilities, you've got... So these guys are nurtured in an environment where there are a lot of things that they are getting. Uh, so it's a fine line. A young man should be able to replace his tires when he needs to, because a scholarship doesn't cover that. But, you know, it's the old, how much freedom is too much freedom. So it's challenging. I don't have the answer, but uh, um, I don't want to be the end result of the problem, and that's getting rid of Olympic sports. So great question. So I had a great time with you all today. Catch some matches. Our crowds have grown uh, to the third largest in the country. So we got some really hardworking people. They're a lot of fun. You can let all your energy out. You can scream and yell and get nuts in the arena and have fun. So God bless you guys again. Goodbye. It was a great day. Have a great week. I won't be here next week, so you have to be a Rotarian for the next two weeks.